We have a special guest tonight, dear brother of our church that's going to come share the word of God, one who is an excellent Bible teacher and preacher, Brother Doug Kudelak. God bless you, brother. Let me give you the inside story about the movement to the front of the church. I asked the pastor to do that, uh, to request that. I saw him do it about four or five years ago, and people actually responded. You know, this is, this is not quite a miracle equal with Elijah calling down fire from heaven, but it's close. Because I think most Baptists, once they take their seat, their favorite hymn is, I shall not be moved. <laughs> my text tonight is Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. And my topic is, finding and doing the will of God in your life. The text says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. And do not be conform... I didn't turn this on, did I? I think I got it now. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good, acceptable, and perfect. Last Sunday night, Bruce Gass preached from this same text, and I had, when he, when he took the text, I said, well, I've already, God had already placed in my mind to preach on the topic of verse 2. And it's interesting how God works this way. He focused on verse 1. I want to focus on verse 2. And this is one of those passages you could actually find four, five, six sermons in it without, without much difficulty at all. And so he focused on the first part. I'm going to focus on the second. But I want to say a few preliminary things first. Uh, down here in, uh, well, First of all, he talks about us being transformed sinners. You know, we're transformed by the grace of God, by the work of God in our hearts. When we trust Christ, God changes us on the inside. He begins the work of transforming us into the image of Christ. And the process of sanctification continues throughout our lives until God glorifies us in death or at the rapture. And uh, because we have a transformed inside, God wants us to have a transformed outside as well. The way we live should and must be different than what it was before God changed us on the inside. Uh, and we're to do that by presenting our bodies as a living sacrifice. And as Bruce was preaching last week, I got to thinking, how many living sacrifices are there in the Bible? You know, under the law, well, when, when, when Abel offered his sacrifice, it was a dead animal. When Noah af offered sacrifice after the flood, those were dead animals. Under the law, the priests offered dead animals. The Passover lamb was a dead animal. And I could only find one living sacrifice in the Bible, and that's Isaac in Genesis chapter 22. Uh, when he, and, and, you know, it's an interesting account. I'd, I'd love to preach on that passage also. But here, Isaac, maybe 15 years old, he's with his father who's over 100 years old, not as old as 100 years would be today because he lived to 179. But he could easily have resisted his father. You know, he's asking the father, well, we got the fire, the knife, and where's the sacrifice? Oh, son, that's going to be you. Uh, he didn't say that. He said, God will provide the sacrifice. Of course, he believed in his mind that God had already provided the sacrifice in his son. And it says he arranged the wood and bound his son and took the knife to slay him. His son was already on the altar. He was literally a living sacrifice on the altar. And you and I are to be a living sacrifice as well. God wants us to, uh, to function not as dead sacrifices, as martyrs to the faith. He wants us to be living witnesses for the faith primarily. And in order to do this, we need to surrender our wills. And that's something that we don't like to do. Uh, but there's the necessity of self-surrender. What did Jesus say in Matthew 16? He said, if, anyone must, if anybody wants to follow after me, he must deny himself. It's not you should, you ought to, it's a good idea. If you're going to follow Christ, you have to surrender your will to God. And I'll come in a little bit, I'll talk about Jesus' example of surrendering his will to God. Uh, but we need to surrender our will to God. And more than that, as a living sacrifice, we need to do it often. Matthew's, or Luke's parallel account to the Matthew 16 says, take, uh, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily. You know, how often do you have to, do I, you and I have to surrender our will to God? Every day and frequently during the day, over and over again, because there's times we want to do things our way and not God's way, and we have to say, no, God wants it this way, and I have to surrender again and again and again. As long as we're living sacrifices, we have to subordinate our will to His repeatedly, because our will doesn't always, doesn't always coincide with God's will for us. 
And someone has well said that we being living sacrifices, the biggest problem with that is that we are too much inclined to crawl off the altar. And it's in, in verse 1 it also says that this self-denial is not an unnecessary burden. It's not something that, you know, it's, it's way beyond the pale. How dare God ask us to do that? Uh, no, we have been purchased uh, by God. Don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit which you have from God and you are not your own. Amen. You know, growing up, what's the ugliest word in the mouth of a two-year-old? It's the word mine, <coughs> right? They pull toys from other kids. Everything is mine, mine, mine. Well, this is just, they're expressing the nature that you and I have as self-centered, self-focused, self-absorbed beings. And God has every right to command us what to do because we are not our own. We have been bought with a price. Just like the Israelites were, were redeemed from Egypt by God and brought out of the house of bondage and slavery and they became His people, because He had redeemed them, He had every right to command them, you shall have no other gods before Me. You shall not make any graven images. You know, do not take the Lord's name in vain and the other commandments there in Exodus chapter 20. And because Christ has purchased us with the price of His own blood, we are slaves of Christ now instead of slaves of sin. You know, Paul, his, his characteristic term for himself is a slave of Christ. It's usually translated servant. But there's, there's other words for servant in Greek. This one is doulos, which means a bond slave. Somebody who is legally bound to his owner to do his owner's will. And we are bound to Christ because of the redemption which we have in Him. So that's verse 1. I just wanted to throw that in, you know. Uh, but verse 2 is what I want to focus on. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by, by, by testing you may prove what is the will of God, what is, what is good and acceptable and perfect. God does have a will for the whole of creation, for the flow of history, for the flow of uh, the rise and fall of nations, and for you and me as individuals. He has a will for the whole world, and He has a will for you and for me individually as well. Uh, sometimes God's will is directive and sovereign. When He doesn't consult people, he, the hum, human choices have no part in it, such as the creation. God decided to create and He did. Let there be light, and there was light. Uh, God also, uh, the incarnation of Christ, He didn't ask for permission. He just brought it about that Jesus, Jesus was born of a virgin. Uh, the, the death of Jesus was also, although humans participated and cooperated, it was God's plan and God worked it in such a way that even with their evil hands, they wrought the greatest good in history, which was the death of Christ. Uh, also His resurrection. He didn't consult anybody about that. He sovereignly raised Christ from the dead. That was His perfect will to restore Christ to life because the sacrifice He offered was a perfect one. Uh, likewise, the second coming of Christ. God's not going to ask anybody's permission. Jesus is going to come when it's His time to come. God has set a time when Jesus will come back. Uh, we long for that day. I, know, I rejoice in the fact that it's closer today than it was yesterday. And if, it's, and if it was right now in the middle of my sermon, I'm willing to, to yield the pulpit. <laughs> and the day of judgment, also a day that God is not going to ask for human permission to pass judgment on the sins of all unredeemed mankind. God is sovereign in those things and His will will be done in those areas regardless of whether people want it or cooperate or object to it or anything else. On the other hand, there is also the general will that He has for all of mankind which does involve human response to God. And then of course the specific will that He has for my particular life, in my place, in my time, in my circumstances. You know, there is a promised blessing for doing God's will. You, know, that, you might think, well, that, that's, makes, that's obvious. Yes, it is obvious, but God tells us sometimes He tells us the obvious because we're not paying close attention. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, this is in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus says this, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. It's not people who talk a good religious game, who talk about Jesus, who say that they know Jesus and all that stuff, but it is actually those who have done the will of God. Those are the one, they're the ones who will enter the Kingdom of Heaven. Well, what is the will of God that He's talking about? Well, I'm glad you asked that. I have, I have the answer, comparing Scripture with Scripture. John chapter 6, verse 40. This is in Capernaum. Jesus has fed the 5,000 the day before. The people want another free lunch. Jesus refuses. He offers to them instead the bread which came down from Heaven, which was Himself. And here's what He said there in John chapter 6, verse 40. He says, for this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son 
and believes in him should have eternal life and I will raise him on the last day. So this is the perfect will of God is that people would see Jesus, know who he is and trust him as their savior. They will be saved and they will experience the resurrection of the righteous uh, later, in, later in time. Amen. So this is, somebody wants to know what's the will of God for me? Well, if you're lost, he wants you to be saved. He wants you to repent of your sins, to turn to him in humility and repentance and find eternal life. That's the first, that's the first thing. And, you know, this is also emphasized in 1 Timothy chapter 2, uh, where Paul is talking about uh, something, this being, this is the will of God our Savior who wants all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. It is God's will that all people come to, you know, God wants all people to be saved. Now, this is not a sovereign choice where he imposes salvation on anybody, but people come to Christ when they learn the truth, when they know the truth about Him, when they hear the gospel message, faith comes through hearing the message, that is hearing the message about Christ, as Paul says in Romans chapter 10. So it's God's will that everyone be saved, although He does allow for the human choice involved in the result. He wants people to be saved. He makes the provision for the salvation of all through the death of Christ. But people can and do say no to God to their own eternal regret. It's interesting, I've heard people object to the Bible and to Christianity. Well, it's God sends, God should, you know, if God was a God of love, why, would he, why does He send people to hell? Well, He does not send people to hell. He, he gives them the justice of the course that they have chosen. And the truth is, anyone who goes to hell does so against the will of God. God is not willing that any should perish but that all should meet the condition of salvation which is coming to repentance, coming to a knowledge of the truth in Jesus Christ. So if somebody tells you, well, you're, you know, God sends people to hell. No, He doesn't. People choose to go to hell because they refuse the grace of God and God's grace is offered to everyone. So there's the promised blessing of doing the God will, God's will. Uh, in our verse, it also talks about the will of God. Let me get back to the text. It talks about... Uh, that you may discern, uh, but, you, but that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, which is good, acceptable, and perfect. Back more than half a century ago, does that sound terrible, Pastor? <laughs> half a century ago, when I was in Bible college, there was a good little, there was a little book, for the most part, pretty good, by a guy named G. Christian Weiss, one of the teachers for Back to the Bible broadcast in Lincoln, Nebraska. I don't even know if they still have that broadcast anymore. Uh, I haven't heard it in years, but his name was G. Christian Weiss. And he wrote a little book that was very popular, and I read it then. It's called The Perfect Will of God. And it, on the same subject that I'm on, talking about tonight, uh, he said on this passage that he, that he understood these three terms, good, acceptable, and perfect, to be sort of concentric circles of the will of God. Out here is the good will of God. Here's the more acceptable will of God. Here's the perfect will of God. Well, it might have made it for good preaching, but that's not what the text says. This is three descriptive terms of the will of God. All of them are the same will of God that is being described here. The first thing it says about the will of God is that God's will is good, right? If God is good all the time, His will for you and me is good all the time. We may not like His will, we may not understand His will, but it is good. And the truth is God's will is always best for me whether I like it or not. Yes, what God wants in my life is best for me because God is inherently good and His will for me is good and right. And of course that's, that's because He knows all things. He knows what the consequence of my decisions today will be tomorrow, next week, next year. Uh, he knows the future. Uh, he knows what is best for me in my life to accomplish His purposes in my life. And so God's will, first of all, it's good, it, it's good whatever it is. Whatever God's will for my life is, it is good. That's the first thing. You know, and that, that, that includes even no matter how well you think you have planned out your life and the plans that you have. And you'll pardon a personal illustration, but back when I first went to Wichita State University, I graduated half the first, uh, after one semester of, high, of the senior year of high school. So I was, I was in college before I graduated from high school. Uh, and uh, I had plans. I had great plans. They were well thought out, consulted with my father, and he approved. I was going to study a double major in political science and in business administration. I was going to get a bachelor's degree, I hoped in three years instead of four. I'm going to go to law school, probably KU, get a law degree, and then go into business, maybe politics, become rich, famous, and all those other things that, are, that people aspire to, right? Well, 
during the first semester, actually during the first month at Wichita State, God began to reveal His will to me. And the first one was that I be saved. I started reading the Gospel of Matthew, discovered what a sinner I was, and came to Christ in chapter 11. So I fulfilled the first part of God's will for me by accepting Christ, right? God was not willing that I should perish, but that I should come to repentance, and I did. And after about a year and a half later, uh, God called me into the ministry. And so this, you know, now there's something lawyers and preachers are somewhat alike. It's hard to imagine, right? No, no. They both have a set, a written set of, of the, standard, the standard of truth is written laws, either in Scripture or in the, the legal code. And both of them appeal to that, and both of them argue for their case before an audience and seek for a verdict, right? Every time you preach, you preach for a verdict. Every time a lawyer speaks in the courtroom, he's seeking for a verdict. And so there was some similarity, and you'd be surprised how many lawyers became preachers. C.I. Schofield and, uh, and a number of other fellows who were lawyers became preachers. Sam Jones, the Methodist evangelist of the 19th century, and so on. But God, I had my pl I planned out, and I, you know, at least 10 years in advance, I was sort of like George Bailey in It's a Wonderful Life. You know, he knew what he was going to do next week and next month and next year, and things didn't turn out as he hoped. Uh, but God's plans are better for me than anything I could plan for myself. Because He knows all things. He knows me better than I know myself. He knows what is best for me. You know, sometimes God gives us failure in our lives because He knows success would ruin us. Yeah. And, and the truth is, He also does, sometimes doesn't give us riches because He knows that riches could ruin us. More people have been ruined by having too much money than, not, than having not enough. Poverty hasn't ruined as many people as riches has. You don't think so? Study the lives of the people who win the lotteries. It almost always ends in a disaster. Because they're not, the money is, the money consumes their lives. But God's plans for me are better than anything I could plan for my, His will for me is better than anything I could will for myself. He knows the consequences of my cho choices. You know, and this is, this is one of those things that, you know, we know that God's will for my life, my children's life, my grandchildren's life is best. But I was amazed some years ago, I was at a missions conference, and there was a missionary speaker, and he asked, how many of you, know, how many of you people, how many of you parents would be willing for your children or your grandchildren to go to a foreign country as missionaries? And I was appalled at the number of hands that did not go up. You know, I don't want my kids going to somewhere in darkest Africa or in East Asia or somewhere in Eastern Europe or someplace else. In the, I'll see them once every four years. What you're saying is, my will for my children and grandchildren is better, and I know better for what is good for them than, what, than God does. And I would rather have them live out of the will of God so I can see them more often than to be in the center of God's will serving Him in Uruguay or someplace else. You know, we have to evaluate our motives here sometimes. But so God's, planning, God's will for me is, first of all, good. And it's the best that there is. Secondly, it's pleasing. It's pleasing to Him. If I do, if I follow God's will, then I will be pleasing to Him. You know, Jesus always did those things which pleased His Father. And what did the Father say at His baptism? This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And what is it that we want on the judgment day when God passes judgment on believers' conduct? He says, he, we want God to say to us, well done, good and faithful servant. And that only comes by surrendering our will to God. And then it says also that God's will is complete. God knowing all things doesn't leave anything out. He doesn't miss any of the details. Nothing is overlooked. Nothing is omitted. He knows what He's doing, although we sometimes don't think He does. Right? So that's, that's the will of God. It is these things. It's good, and it's pleasing, and it's complete. Well, that, that, ought, that right there ought to be enough reason for us to surrender his will, to His will instead of following our own. But that brings the question, how do we find God's will for us? How do you do that? Do you read G. Christian Weiss's book? Well, that would be helpful if you can find a copy. Uh, the best way to know the will of God is to know the Word of God, because God is never, ever going to lead you contrary to what it says in this book. He is not going to lead you contrary. And I give you examples. Uh, I've seen it in Romania. I've seen it in other places that I've in places that I've lived. Somebody thinks, well, I, can, I know it's not right, but I can do it anyway, and God, God will bless it. Uh, particularly, I'm thinking of the case of a Christian young lady in, in church in Cincinnati. She had a boyfriend. He was not a believer, and she'd been warned, it's not, you should not marry him because it says, do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. I know it says that, but he's such a nice guy, and he's a hard worker, and he loves me, and God will save him afterwards. Sometimes God does. 
Sometimes God does. But I'd say about nine times out of ten, in my experience, it doesn't work out that way. And uh, it didn't work out in this young lady's case. It, uh, she was, she, instead of coming to church faithfully as she had been, she dropped out and her, the kids were not raised in the church and so on. But this is, you know, doing something that you know God says is wrong is outside of the will of God. Uh, Christian businessmen as well. I've heard testimonies, maybe from some of you, that uh, in business, you had a business partner, they were competent in certain areas of the business that you were not, and so you joined a partnership with them, and it turned out badly because their ethics, their morals, their character, their integrity was not what a believer should have. So, we are not supposed to be unequally yoked with unbelievers. And uh, so, you know, oh, I'm going to do this, and I know God will bless it. That's the wrong way to think. If God says don't do it, don't do it. I mean, it's as simple as that. A.W. Tozer, uh, he was a CMA, Christian Missionary Alliance preacher in Chicago in the 50s and 60s. Very, very quotable. You can find all kinds of quotes by him on the internet. Uh, he said this. I didn't find this one. I've, I'd seen it someplace else. He said, most Christians don't discover the will of God because they have decided in advance that they are not going to do it. I mean, is that, a, is that a convicting quote? Yeah, the reason why well, I can't find the will of God for my life. Well, are you willing to do it? Well, not real. I want to know what it is first. God doesn't work that way. You know, I, 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 it, the will of God for your life and mine is not a menu at a restaurant that you can pick and choose what you want and leave out what you don't want. You, it's God's will for you. You take it as it is. And you take it, you have to be willing to do it before you know what it is. Oh, yeah. You know, why should God tell you what His will is if you're not decided whether you're going to do it or not? A preacher friend of mine in Cincinnati, he had a fellow in his church that he had counseled with because of some problems in his life. And he counseled with him, spent a lot of time with him, invested a lot of time telling him what he ought to do. And then the guy didn't do it. And his problems continued. Well, he came back from the preacher for more counseling. And the, and the first thing the preacher said to him, are you going to do what I tell you? He said, well, I don't know what you're going to tell you. I don't know what you're going to tell me. He said, well, then I'm not going to tell you anything. Because if you're not going to agree to do it in advance, why should I waste my time telling you? And if we're not agreed in advance to do God's will, whatever it is that He reveals to us, why should He tell us? You know, we have to have an attitude that I'm willing to do what God wants me to do, regardless of what it is, regardless of the personal price, regardless of the personal sacrifice. A great verse over in John chapter 7, verse 17. Jesus says this, If anyone is willing to do God's will, he will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I am speaking on my own authority. But the first part of this especially, if anyone is willing to God's to know to, if anyone is willing to do God's will, he will know. You start by saying, God, whatever you want me to do, here am I, send me. You start with the attitude, whatever God's will for me is, I am willing to do it. Not I'm going to decide whether I want to do it or not, but be willing to do it. You know, when in the Lord's Prayer, what do we pray? Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Right? Well, you're praying that God's will be done on earth, not just among nations and in other people's lives. That's praying that God's will be done in my life too. Right? And sometimes God's will is difficult because, well, His perfect will for you and me is to be conformed to the image of Jesus. And looking at my own self in the spiritual mirror every day, I don't look very much like Jesus. And so God has to do what the blacksmiths down at Silver Dollar City do. They put, take a piece of iron, put it in the fire, heat it up, and then pound on it. And God sometimes has to heat me up and pound on me and heat me up and pound on me over and over again to get me into any useful shape for Him. And I suspect that you're not a whole lot different than I am. I'm afraid that most of the time, in reality, we don't want to do God's will. We want God to conform His will to what we've already decided to do. And that is not going to work. You know, Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me. Uh, you know, the, some people misunderstand that passage, think that the cross is some, some difficulty in your life. It may be poverty, it may be a sickness, it may be a sick child, it may be a death in the family, or some other thing, that, some circumstance. That's not what it is. The cross in your life is your voluntary execution of your will for the sake of Christ. Voluntarily take up our cross and follow Him to the point where our will is surrendered completely. You remember what Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane? Three times He prayed, not my will but yours be done. And if we are following Him, that has to be the prayer of our, of our heart constantly. You know, follow me, He says. Well, look in John's Gospel. There's, there's four passages here that talk about Jesus and the will of God in His life. 
John chapter 4, verse 34, it says, Jesus said, this is when the disciples went into town for lunch and brought back lunch and Jesus didn't eat it. Uh, it's one of the most amazing things, the passage. The disciples go into town and bring back food. The lady, the Samaritan woman, went into town and brought back people. I mean, she'd been saved for 15 minutes, and she knows to evangelize lost people. We've some of us been saved 50, 60 years, and are very reluctant to do it. John 3, uh, 434, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. I can't, my purpose in life is to fulfill God's will and to bring it to a conclusion, a completion in my life. And this is, theme is repeated again in chapter 5, verse 30, where Jesus says, for I can do nothing of my own. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And in chapter 6, verse 38, Jesus says, For I have, not, I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And then in chapter 8, verse 29, Jesus says one more time, He says, and he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. His will was surrendered to God in everything, his teaching, his life, his healing, everything. It was surrendered to God. He said, I always do those things which please my father. None of us could say that without, with, a, with a straight face. We know that we have failed God multiple times, constantly, but I hope that we are wanting to please God. You know, so Jesus is our example, and he says, follow me. And, he said, and his following him means to surrender our will to God over and over and over again. Do it daily. You know, in contrast to this, we have the, in Proverbs 14, 14, a backslider in heart is filled with his own ways. Instead of God's ways and God's will, he's filled with his own I think we should, I think, I want to do it this way, God. I think this would be best for me, God. I want to do this. I want to do that. I'm sorry you want me to do that, but I've got plans. Uh, we need to examine ourselves very carefully. So, this, you know, this is God's will for us, is to surrender our wills to His. Uh, secondly, part of, second part of God's will is our sanctification. Over in 1 Thessalonians, I'll read several connected verses here. Second, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, we know what's in the end of that chapter, that's the rapture passage, but the first part of this is also important. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 4, the first eight verses, Finally then, brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus that as you receive from us how you ought to live and to please God, just as you are doing, that, that you do so more and more. For, we know, for you know what instruction we gave through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification. Sanctification is one of, one of those long Latin words. It simply means God wants us to live lives separate from the world around us. Without our, without our minds, our lives, our philosophy, our point of view, our habits, corrupted by the sinful world in which we live. Be transformed, not conformed to this world, he says in Romans chapter 1, or chapter 12. And this is the will of God, your sanctification. And he explains that you abstain from sexual immorality, which is rampant in our world, that each of you knows how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one transgress and wrong his brother in this matter, because the Lord is an avenger in all these things. And we told you beforehand and solemnly warned you, for God has not called us to impurity, but to holiness. Therefore, whoever disregards this disregards not man, but God, who gives His Holy Spirit to you. So we are not we are to live a life that is distinct. You know, we're not to have our life controlled by the culture around us. I mean, if you're not if you're paying any attention at all, you know that the culture around us is exceedingly corrupt, and much more so today than it was 10 years, 20 years, 50 years ago. I mean, there's things that are talked about commonly and done openly that 50 years ago no one would have thought of saying them or doing them. I can remember when Romans chapter 1, that whole list of the sins of the Gentiles, verses 18 through 32, it was embarrassing to read that in public because these were shameful things that people didn't talk about. But now it's commonplace. It's on, this, it's in TV, it's on TV. I mean, this, this is the entertainment that people want to see It's in, in such things. So we are, to be a, we are to be sanctified. This is God's perfect will for me that I be different from the world around me. Now this doesn't mean putting on a smug look and with our nose in the air that we're, you know, we're holier than thou. But it means we are actually in fact to live differently than others. Because it is the right thing to do. Because it is the will of God. You know, and this whole, this whole uh, concept of sanctification, what does this mean? It means following God's commands. Uh, this, I just thought of this while I was writing these notes up. I have never gone through the letters of Paul and written out every, or 
copied out every command that he gives to the believers that he has in his letters. I, I may do this sometime, just get a brand new Bible or Bible that's not been marked in and just underline in red every time Paul gives a command. Every time. You know, how many commands do you think there are in the book of Romans and 1 Corinthians and in 2 Corinthians and Galatians? Ephes Ephesians chapter, se chapter 4 verses 17 through chapter 5 verse 17 is the, is the most extended passage in the New Testament about the ethics that believers are supposed to follow. Let him who stole steal no more. Let him labor with his hands. And on and on and on he gives instructions. And all that's involved with our sanctification which is God's perfect will for your life and mine. Or go through the book of James. Note all the commands there. Or First Peter, all the commands there. The, you know, these aren't just there for our, for our information, they're for our, uh, for our uh, obedience and our following. Um, so, you know, this is God's will for us. First, that we be saved. Secondly, that we surrender our will. Thirdly, that we be sanctified. Now, this, you know, this covers general areas. But what about specific, the will of God in specific areas of your life? Well, there's, obvi there's obviously a subjective element, right, in every person's life uh, about what is God's will for me? Does He want me to take this job? Does He want me to marry this person? Should I go to school here? Uh, you know, should I, should I buy a house here? What church should I go to? And these are all subjective things that you have to, that you have to seek guidance for. And obviously the thing to do is to pray for direction from God. You know, there are times where I've been invited to go preach in a church and, it's, and I'm not sure that I can, or if I, to go on a trip to Europe and, and circumstances don't quite work. Well, I think I'll give you one example. I don't, I don't like to draw examples from my life, but this is before we started coming to church here. Uh, this is like 2002. Um, I was invited to go on a trip to Romania and to teach and preach there. And the, the, this is a long time ago. The ticket was some like, something like 600 and some dollars. They're about double or triple that now. Uh, and I didn't have the money at all. And so I, this on a Monday I said, God, I said, you know, if you want me to go on this trip, if you want me to go on this trip, you're going to have to provide the funds because I don't have it. And not 10 minutes later, and it was not 10 minutes later, I get a call from a preacher in Texas. He was one of my students years ago, and I had preached in one of his churches, but he was not a supporting church. He said, I just called you to let you know that on Sunday, before I prayed, he said, the deacons voted to send you $500 to cover, help cover expenses on your next trip. Wow. I discerned it was the will of God for me to go. <laughs> oh, I talked about the first time that I've ever, ever met Pastor Holcomb in 1991. We went to, we went to Romania for the very first time. Uh, we were going to, I was in a church in Wichita and heard about this trip that was being planned. This was in November. The trip was in March. And I thought, man, I'd love to do that. And so I inquired about it, and it seemed like I could go, except I didn't have any money. Uh, and I had a job that I couldn't get out of. And uh, so bus un unsolicited, unsolicited, a businessman in the church came up to me and says, how much is your ticket going to be to Romania? And I told him, he said, could I cover that for you? Mm -hmm. The next week, another businessman, I had not even thought to pray about these things yet. He came up to me and said, how much, you have a job, yes. How much money are you going to lose because you're going to be off the job? And I told him the amount, he said, could I cover that for you? Let me tell you, I was discerning the will of God in all of that. <laughs> and and uh, it was a fantastic trip, as Brother Holcomb could, has told us many times. Uh, met Benny Costia, which was fantastic in itself. Uh, and I have made 80 more trips to Eastern Europe or a few to Central America as a result of God's leading in that one thing there. And, you know, it was easy to discern the will of God at that time. Other times it's not so easy. But pray for direction. If God gives you opportunities for service, take them and, he, and serve in whatever capacity you have an opportunity to now, and then God may lead you on to other things. It's easier to steer a boat that is moving than one that's still in the water. So if you're active in serving God and what you know to do, then He can have opportunity to direct you further. Um, Seek peace with God about decisions. You know, there's sometimes I'm not sure what to do about something, and I pray about it. I say, God, if you want me to do this, give me peace of mind about it so I know it's the right thing to do. And I've found that God does that if it's the, if it's the right decision. Uh, seek counsel from other believers. I've had a decision I've been working on for about a year and a half, and I've sought the counsel of several, several other people. And they've, they had, didn't have any suggestions that were definitive, but they said, we will pray for you that God will reveal His will. He hasn't done it yet, so I'm still working on that. Uh, but even the Apostle Paul had to discern God's will. You know, one of Paul's goals was to go to Rome. 
And he wrote, when he was in Corinth, he wrote the book of Romans, and he said, I've been planning to, planning to come see you for quite a while, but I've had this hindrance and that hindrance and so on. And chapter, Romans, chapter 1 of Romans verse 10, he says, uh, for, or verse 11, for a long to, uh, no, it is verse 10, always in my prayers asking that somehow by God's will I may now at la last succeed in coming to you, for I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. So he says, I've been wanting to come to Rome, see the city, and then let you help me go on to Spain. He talks about that in chapter 15, where he talks about uh, his seeking God's will to go to Rome, be a blessing, encourage them, and use, the, use Rome as a springboard to go even further with the gospel. And he says this in Romans chapter 15, verse 22. This is the reason why I have so often been hindered from coming to you. But now since I no longer have any room for work in these regions, and since I have longed for many years to come to you, I hope to see you in passing as I go to Spain and to be helped on my journey there by you, once I have enjoyed your company for a while. Well, Paul ultimately did make it to Rome, but not as he planned. I assume that he had planned a nice peaceful sail across the, Adri across the Adriatic and perhaps across, across by land on the Appian Way to Rome. But he ended up in jail in Caesarea for two years and ended up in a horrible ship, uh, ship journey. I wonder if he asked for his fare back on that one. This cruise wasn't at all what I had in mind. And he uh, shipwrecked on an island, bitten by a snake, eventually ends up in Rome, but he's still in chains. But he uses that opportunity in Rome to evangelize the Praetorian Guard. That's, that's the secret service that looked after the emperor. I mean, some, you know, God works ways that we can't even begin to imagine. His will was perfect for Paul in those things. But Paul had to discern God's will in these things as well. He had the desire to go to Rome, which is a good thing, but God worked at a different path. And, and Paul didn't actually have to pay his fare. He got, he, he was, he got a free ride on a boat at government expense. And one thing, a phrase you find in Paul's letters more than once is the phrase, if God is willing. Back in the day, people used to, when, they would, when people actually wrote letters and mailed them with stamps and all, you're familiar with this, some of, these, some of you younger people. You've, and they would write a letter and I say, well, you know, we hoped to come to Wichita and see you at Christmas time, DV. What does DV stand for? That stands for Deo Volente, in the will of God, if God is willing. You know, all of our plans are contingent upon if God is willing. You know, sometimes we have things planned and God interrupts our plans. I remember one time I got to the airport in Wichita. Uh, I was flying to Romania or Hungary, I don't remember which, and my ticket was through Atlanta and they said, do you want to go to Atlanta today? I said, no, I'm going all the way to Romania. They said, no, you can't because there's a volcano in Iceland. You know, I was, I was, I was all planned to go, I had my bags packed uh, and all my notes ready, my Bible in my bag. And my plans were interrupted by a volcano that I had no control over. I went about a month later when the volcano stopped, I went again. Uh, so, you know, your plans are contingent. And something else about the will of God, God rarely reveals the whole of his will to anybody. You know, uh, if you'd asked me in Bible college when I had surrendered to preach and I was there in first year, second, even when I graduated, after I'd had four, I'd had, you know, I was in Bible college, had a bachelor's degree and I studied Greek. So, you know, I was ready to, to conquer the world. You laugh, and yeah, you know, right? Uh, but I had no idea what God, I played, you know, God directed me to seminary, then he directed me to graduate school, and I taught Christian, in a Christian high school for five years, then he directed me to go to, to Romania and all these other places. He didn't reveal that to me all at once. As you, you know, when I was in Bible college, well, you, now that you've graduated, here's what you're going to be doing 35 years from now. You're going to be going to Eastern Europe, to Ukraine, and, and maybe to Armenia, and so on. No, God reveals it sometimes a day at a time, sometimes a, a moment at a time. Uh, but God, so don't expect God to tell you what your life plan is going to be at the beginning. Yeah, because it's, uh, you, you, you and I couldn't handle it if he did. And as I said earlier, if you're seeking God's will, whatever your spiritual responsibilities are, whatever your avenue of service for God is, be faithful in doing that and be open for additional avenues of service. And uh, God will guide you in these things. But the, but the key thing is to be willing to do whatever God's will is for you, as revealed in Scripture, as revealed by the Holy Spirit in your mind and conscience and the guidance that He gives uh, uh, and the peace that He gives when you seek a decision on something. But be willing to do it obey it, whatever it is, and be open for future direction. That's how you find the will of God. Now, like, a whole lot more could be said on this subject, but I think that this is an introduction. Everyone, I, I think, I would hope that everyone here wants to do the will of God, and has, you know, in theory at least, and, but doing it in practice takes a lot of work. Self-surrender, 
obedience, service, and all of those things. Let's pray. Our Father, we do thank you that you have a will for our lives. We thank you that you love us. We thank you that Christ died to save us. We thank you that, all, that it is your perfect will that all who trust in Christ will have eternal life and will be raised from the dead at the, at the last day. And Father, we thank you that you have a will for our lives as believers, that you want us to be separate from the world. You want us to be sanctified. You want us to be conformed to the image of Christ. You want us to surrender our will as Christ surrendered his will. God, these are difficult things for sinners. We do pray that you might give us encouragement and uh, guidance as we seek to find and do your will in our lives day by day. I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you so much, Doug. Would you all please stand? Everybody standing.